Last year, the BBC invited a community of Benedictine monks to take part in a unique experiment. They agreed to share the rigors of monastic life with five outsiders for 40 days. The monks believe their ancient tradition has something of deep value to offer the modern world, and they wanted to prove it. We find that people say to us that they've got more and more of all these superficial pleasures in life, and yet at a deeper level, they're not happy. We believe that what we're offering is in fact the answer to that dissatisfaction with life. Dedicated to spiritual growth through prayer, meditation and harmonious communal living, the monks live by strict rules set out by St. Benedict 1,500 years ago. The five men, from very different backgrounds, were selected by the BBC from hundreds of volunteers. None share the Roman Catholic beliefs of the monks, but each is willing to undertake a genuinely open search for spiritual meaning. Christopher, who is in the superior of the community. All agreed to leave behind family, friends and careers and to forsake the outside world for 40 days and 40 nights. The group spent the first two weeks trying to get used to the daily monastic routine of prayer, meditation, manual labor, and religious instruction. The shock of entering the monastery is over. The challenge now is to discover whether this ancient vision of mankind's place in the world has anything valuable to teach five modern men. It's the start of week three. Today, like every day, begins with prayers at 20 past six in the morning. The new residents all face personal challenges. Gary McCormick is 36, single, and works as a painter and decorator. He's a committed Christian. But since arriving, his troubled past has regularly invaded the present. Brought up in Northern Ireland, he joined the Protestant Ulster Defence Association at 18. I was caught up in it, and, you know, I loved the whole orange, or, uh, orange, orange marches. I loved the 12th of July. I loved the bands. I loved the... I, I, I was... I loved the UDA. I really did. Gary was accused, he says falsely, of firebombing a shop, then vandalising a Catholic home. He was in and out of prison until he found God 13 years ago. I was on the way to my death when I received faith because I'd just been uh, taken away by four men from Northern Ireland to have a punishment beaten, and I thought they were going to kill me. Land in the footwell of the back of a car, that's when I asked Christ into my life. Gary left Northern Ireland but continues to struggle with alcohol and low self-esteem. He's hoping that his time in the monastery will help him come to terms with who he is. I really hope that I can look at this stuff and, and uh, face it full on and believe for a change, that I am a person with worth, that I am a person with esteem. And I hope that I can start to believe it about myself. Nick Buxton is 37, single, and studying for a PhD in Buddhist theology. He was brought up as an Anglican, but struggles to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He respects the monastic way of life, but is not sure it always makes sense. You know, when I'm feeling a bit dark and negative, I sort of look and I think, nah, come on. 20 single men living together like this, I mean, that alone is bizarre, you know, by any, by any standard. You have, to, you have to find some way of judging whether actually this is, this is completely nuts or whether actually it's, it's the only truly sane way to live. Anthony Wright is ambitious and successful and believes in some form of higher being. During his first two weeks in the monastery, his spiritual search has been hampered by a reluctance to open up to the group. I will gradually drip feed you and give you the information so when I make that picture very clear for you, you get that full picture, you can understand what I'm talking about. You might be quite closed about the actual specific reason why you're here up to this point, up to 10 days in, but you are very open about 
who you are, who you see, where you go, what you own. Anthony was brought up by his grandmother and still struggles to come to terms with his mother's absence. He is now willing to open up about his past, but only in private conversations with monks. I feel as if I spent my childhood crying all the time. I was very sad all the time. So this me, who I am, I created this person in order to get away a lot of the pain because half of my friends wouldn't even drink, they wouldn't even know any of this. They'd be like, what? Mm. We never see that in you because you put this complete, oh, Anthony's cool, he's, you know, he's, he's, oh, he's sorted, he's got it all together, he's all, he's all disciplined. Mm. He's, and yet they don't really see what's behind it all. So it's quite yeah. interesting that that person is there, yeah. but there's this other person behind it. 69-year-old Peter Griffith is a retired teacher and published poet. He's married with children and wants to re-examine the Christian faith of his childhood. When we first came in, it didn't make sense what we were doing. There didn't seem to be anything other than we had to fit into this pattern. It was slapped on us like an army recruit almost. Just fall asleep in the afternoon. I thought, really, this is just going through ritual and even felt it might be a bit empty. But actually, it isn't. Tony Burke, the last of the five, is 29 and works in advertising in London. Most recently, he's been writing scripts for a sex chat line. He's a non-believer, open to finding true meaning in his life and not averse to challenging the monks. You know, I'm not a bigot. I want to be convinced. If they can't convince me, I'll just go away from this thing unconvinced. You know, that's my challenge to them and in return, their challenge to me. Tony has become increasingly eager to immerse himself in the spiritual life. I really want to get. I really want to get this. For God's sake. Yeah, I really want to get this. I was Sanchez and I, my, I was screaming in my head. I was really shouting, really shouting at God. I was like, you know, fuck everybody else. For Christ's sake, I'm sitting here in your fucking church. Just fucking. Talk to me, for God's sake, you know. Let me know that you're fucking there, if you are. Nothing. Monastic novices may take several years to overcome spiritual doubts. The monks only have their guests for another four weeks the abbot decides to raise the tempo. They've got into the routine. They've now got some intellectual understanding of the values of that routine. I think the challenge now is for them to embrace those values at a deeper level. Abbot Christopher knows the newcomers are backsliding. He's particularly concerned that they regularly fail to observe silent meditation, which is essential to spiritual growth. To remove temptation and avoid distraction, he's invited them to abandon their mobile phones and personal stereos. You mean, yeah, I thought, oh, you mean really yours? Well, have you said no at first? Well, I've thought about it. I'm actually going to keep mine. Yes. And the reason why I'm going to keep it is because I'm going to be strict enough to be able to just use it for the alarm. And I feel that if I keep it myself, then I'll be adult enough to know that I shouldn't use it. Okay. Tempted to use it. Right. I'll just turn it off so you can't read any secret stuff. A few bits of stuff in there. I don't want you to see of it. <laughs> That's time to rise. Once the meeting is finished, Tony decides to confess that he's reached a stumbling block. Oh, wow. I'm going to keep hold of the one I'm reading. So, you, know. so, right, you need a bit of relaxation, don't you? Yeah. Right. And the walk, and that the, the, the thing? Yeah. Wow. You can have headphones if you want. No, sorry. If you want to use it. <laughs> but no, he's, um, you know, it's not, they're nice to have these things, but there is a tendency to kind of shut your door and just lie on your bed like a 15 year old and just listen to music and read your books. And, yeah. Um, which kind of leads me on to what I was going to talk to you about was the fact that, yeah, kind of, um, I've gone off the boil a bit. Yes. Right. Because the first two weeks, you know, it was like coming out after, uh, you know, coming round run, uh, round one, all like fists flying. Yeah. You know, and I feel that I've kind of exhausted myself a little bit, and I kind of, I'm sitting in my corner, 
thinking, I don't really want to be a boxer anymore. I just wondered if you could give me any kind of uh, advice on sort of like how to go headlong straight back into it. Or maybe not headlong, maybe to pace myself a bit. To find your, your breath for round two. Yeah. <clears throat> After a while, the mystique wears off. Yeah. And you start to discover that you're an ordinary person and that monks are ordinary people. Yeah. And that there's not quite as much mystique about it as there was at first. No, because it just becomes part of your new routine, doesn't it? Intact. So what I then say is, now this is the really important moment, because you're going to move from the mystique to the mystical, right. the truly mystical. And the gateway into the truly mystical is demanding. But if you can make the assumption that God wants to say something to you, you may suddenly catch with the ear of your heart an echo of something being said to you. Yeah. Now, that's a process of waiting. All that you should anticipate happening in the six weeks is that you will leave knowing you have begun a spiritual journey that will last you a lifetime. Yeah. And what you need to do now, now you've arrived at this really good point. It's always a good point, isn't it? You always look, <laughs> turn it into the positive. You never say, oh, well you, well, you might as well go home then. <laughs> you know, it's always conveniently a very good point, isn't it? My turning point. It doesn't dissuade me from saying it one minute. OK. What am I going to do with my hoard now? Well, you can read those books. There's a couple of good ones in there. <laughs> Thank you. What am I going to do with all this lot? There's a stop play in there, isn't there. Oh, really? Well, I like them. OK, thank you. Thank you. That really is a good moment, because it means he's starting to leave behind the familiar. And it can be quite scary territory. And it's scary not just like psychotherapy scary, it's scary because ultimately it's to do with meeting God. And that can be scary as well. So, but I hope that they'll feel enough confidence and support to realise that um, actually it's going to be OK because it's going to be something to do with love. And while that may be a little bit difficult at first, actually, when you start to let go into that, it's deeply engaging and endlessly inviting. The monks insist there should be no relaxation of the daily routine. The group must still attend matins each morning at 6.20. All make it on time, nearly every morning. Matins is followed by five more services. Lords, midday prayers, mass, vespers, and finally Compline at 9 p.m. In between, they must observe periods of silence. In the mornings, they study, then practice Tai Chi, meditation or contemplative reading. They eat almost every meal in silence, and after lunch, there is manual work. Hey, um, Gary, we can, because you like chopping things up, we can get on the bottom of this tree. This afternoon, Gary, Anthony and Peter are being supervised in the garden by Father James. We've got some extra he became a monk in his late 20s, giving up a career in teaching and the possibility of marriage. You see, you just turn it over, it turns over quite nicely, and then get these roots out. I just love the life. The most difficult thing, now, here, here we go, the most difficult thing is, um, is trying to live in a community of guys. Yeah. I mean, that is the most difficult thing. They, they either don't like you sometimes, they disapprove of what you're doing, how you look, how you're dressed, uh, how you walk, what you think, what you say. And somehow we've got to find it in our way to, um, to love our brothers. Obviously, you said at one point, once you were in here for four years, you thought about, you know, am I going to get married, blah, 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 the chastity thing. Oh, the chastity I mean, thing! How do you guys deal with that? Because, I mean, come on. We all know that men wake up in the morning and they stand to attention and, and the rest of it, if, it's it, proud. if we can put it that way. Yeah. Uh, there was an old monk here who said that... Um, when asked, did he have any sexual desires, he yeah. said, well, sexual desires cease when the last nail is put in one's coffin. <laughs> good answer. Excellent. And I think, answer. I think that's uh, as good, a, good an answer as any. You don't have to answer the question, James, but if you have, if, if you have a desire for a good bit of rumpy pumpy and you know that you can't do it, you're celibate, we might as well come to the, come to the crunch of it. Do you, would you beat the bishop? Uh, 
Hopefully not. Uh, okay. We'll leave the bishop alone. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a highlight. Yeah, good, good okay. answer. Uh, yeah, get on with it. But, uh, but um, I think it's a good question. Yeah. How, how many other monks have you asked the question? Well, you're the first one. All right, first, okay, yeah. good. Well, yeah. well, let's go for it then. Yeah. There's something troubling us, I think, if we indulge in masturbation. Mm -hmm. And if we do, then what do you think let, that let's forget about is? it and get on with the one's what, day the next what, day. What do you think that something is? Just your interpretation of what it is. I would say some, tr some trouble in the, in, in one, trouble in the spirit, some spiritual trouble, some difficulty, some unresolved issue. I, personally, personally... It, 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 it seems touch wood here. Touch wood seems to be coming easier as time goes on. Yeah. But other other people say, well, that's just a temporary phase. It, it'll get it'll get yeah. difficult again. Yeah. The rule of Saint Benedict demands that each person submit to the needs of the community. Transcending the ego is central to spiritual growth. support each other and discern the movement of the spirit in our own hearts, in our communities, in our congregation and in the church. Learning to live with other people is a key part of learning about yourself and it's a key part of your spirituality. Your spirituality is not just the bit in church, your spirituality is the whole approach to life that you bring. Two of the visitors feel insecure about their place in the group. Anthony fell out with Tony last week. And Gary, who's lived through long periods of isolation in prison, also feels vulnerable. I see myself as that I don't fit into a group of people. Uh, the biggest part of it would be my paranoia. I think that everybody's always talking about me all the time. I feel I'm afraid to leave a group of people because I'm petrified that they talk about me. Have you found that increasing or decreasing during the three weeks here? Twice in here it's, it's increased, but that has only been for a short period of time. Right. I haven't had that fear in front of the monks for some reason. Gary seems to thrive on sharing difficult experiences in a supportive atmosphere. He's frustrated that Anthony resists opening up. I feel that, that he's feared to let down his defences in here, that he's... That he's He's got a lot of facades and masks up and, and he doesn't seem to want to let any of them down. And I struggle with that there. I, I just don't see why I have to tell you everything about me so quickly because um, I've just found too often in, in the past you tell people too much about you, they, they, they have ammunition against you basically. And Sorry, but that's the world we live in, people are like that. So I tend not to give anybody anything or try not to. Gary's antipathy towards Anthony looks set to disrupt the harmony of the whole group. His feelings erupt during an apparently innocuous daily religious discussion. First, he takes exception to the Roman Catholic approach to the Bible. The Catholic Church has always said, traditionally, that our reading of the Bible should be guided by the Church, our understanding should be guided by the Church, to avoid the misuse of the text. I disagree with that. I, I, I knew I shouldn't have mentioned that. The, the, the reasons why I disagree is this here, and, and all the things that you're talking about there, I really, I really deeply disagree. Right. Because a lot of it is is done, and we're, the stuff that we're talking about is from an intellectual point of view. Yes. I once heard a pastor or a preacher say, the longest journey in life is from the mind to the heart, which is 18 inches. It's when I had that personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't see lights. I didn't see anything. But I knew something happened in my heart. Yeah. And from that day onwards, my life started to change. To follow Christ there has to be more of a freedom than to follow religion, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, but this is what they believe in. This is, this is the things that, that have followed on all these thousands of years that they want yeah, to believe yeah. in. So, you know, I, I can't choose to tell them that it's rubbish that they do this. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I never I, actually I, said. I, no, no, I, know, I, never know, I, I, know, I never said you said that. Anthony's intervention enrages Gary because he knows Anthony has never read the Bible. It's the perfect excuse for Gary to vent his frustrations. 
But I'm the sometimes I find that you come across as if, as if I'm stupid. Hold on a second. You're actually discussing something with me, which started off with you saying, how can you have an opinion of something unless you've actually researched it already? Yeah. And I'm saying, well, actually, you can. Well, I don't say think you can. Well, then that's what you think, and that's what I well, think. Perhaps, I think the difficulty perhaps, here is, I think the difficulty here is, is that I'm not supposed to have an opinion. No, but I do not. have an opinion. No, of course, like you no, have an of course you're supposed to have an opinion. And if you're having a conversation with but me, if you're then you're going to get heated. If, listen, the conversation's I'm not getting, you're the one who's getting heated. If you're no, 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 you didn't just walk out. Yeah, sorry. Of course it would be better if I walk out instead of getting hit. Why? Yeah. There was nothing because to get done to you're coming back. across Mr. Hyde and Mary. No, but I'm not. Yes, you are. All the time. Oh, of course you Man, are, you are you aren't you? Yourself. How many people have you fell out with this year since you've been here? Who? Who is that? You fell out with Tony. Now yeah. you fell out with me. That's two. Yeah. Five. Go on. It's yeah. not a very good ratio, is it? Oh, well, I think it's not a bad ratio. Uh, okay. I absolutely resent you know, somebody so point blank to fire at me, you know, oh, well, you know, you're the only one in this group that nobody likes, you know, who, who's nobody? I'm a person. I'm just trying to make my life a little bit peaceful in order for me to proceed and get to where it is that I'm trying to get to, basically, because my answer to finding eternal peace or, you know, getting God to put his saving grace on me is to find eternal peace within myself. If I can't be relaxed with myself, who the hell can I be relaxed with? Each of the guests has chosen a monk as a spiritual mentor, and Anthony seeks guidance from his, Father James. Anthony's been ignoring Gary and Tony. So... The, the kernel of it is that somehow they've got um, a down on you. Yeah? <laughs> if you want to put it like that, I'm not well, like is, particularly is it, bothered. It, but, yeah, but, but is, that, is that where we are? I mean, is yeah, that the word What about, you said, you said you're not averse to, um, to humiliations. Well, I'm not. All right, what about this, then? <laughs> I can imagine you come up with some right, dream is, or something is, really Go and apologise to them. For what? Ah! <laughs> and apologise to them for walking past them and not speaking. Oh, I can ah. do that. Oh, no, that's, no, that's not... I don't see that as humility. Yeah, that's, that's a fair comment. It is a humiliation. That's, that's a fair comment. It's to say, I, I felt uncomfortable doing that. I, I feel that I, I, it might have been an opportunity of trying to repair something there. I didn't do it. <laughs> I am not saying anything accusatory about you. I'm simply taking responsibility myself. For my and they're not looking at them in the eye and saying, what have you got to say for yourselves? No, you're right. I'll take that one on board. That's fair enough. No, I can do that. That's not a problem. And then but I'm not apologising for anything else. No. Not apologising for, for being the showman or being over-secretive no. or, or whatever. No, you don't have to. That's you. That's you. You don't have to apologise for that. But then the more difficult thing... Um, this is the great moralizer now, the great religion man. To find, are you going to be able to find any love in your heart for them? If people don't have disagreements and arguments, they can't discover how much they have to learn about community living. So the presence of the arguments and the disagreements is an important part of the formation process. If it wasn't there, we wouldn't be making progress. Steps. Anthony takes the initiative and gives the monastic approach a try. You came and apologised. I thought it takes, it takes a man with balls to come and apologise to another man. But I wanted to apologise at that point, but you weren't ready, you know, ready, ready for it at that point. And what I learned from that was, Anthony, that everybody isn't the same as me. You know, some people can open up very quickly and some people can't. And I'm just one of those people who can't open up that quickly. Because too often I have done before, and it's just backfired completely. Yeah. Half of it I'll never tell anybody. Yeah. Because it's very hard for me to tell anybody some of that stuff. When I was coming here, I was thinking, well, 
maybe I could come here and somebody will help me to get rid of it. But as you know, Luke told me the other day, well, you're never going to get rid of it. You've got to learn to carry it. You've got the cross, the cross you bear or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, the cross. But, so, you know. Yeah, see, I, I've struggled with the same things for, well, since, since whatever age I can remember. And I, but I must admit, there's something, there is something happening here in my life, without a doubt. I'm glad we, we've yeah, talked. Yeah, I really am, aren't I? And I, I look forward to getting... To know you better than yesterday. And what it seems to be a breakthrough in yeah. mutual understanding. It was really good that we we sat down and we talked about it in a mature way, and you know that's the first time I've ever really done that, and and it and it, it was fantastic. I think an important thing that Gary has pointed out is that you know it's coming here, there is no point leaving here being the same person, and I definitely think that's a very valid point. Now the confrontation is resolved, the hope is that the men will devote more time and effort to the deeper spiritual search. The gamble we've been taking is that if we'll just wait long enough, keep offering them possibilities and wait, they will slowly start to live the monastic life from within, as opposed to just on the basis of the external discipline we give them. Tony's latest problem is purely physical. He's injured his leg out running. You know, it's, it's, it's only something very small. What's up to the knee? Oh, God. Oh, oh, rather it's have a feel, if you like, haven't <laughs> <laughs> As the weeks go by, the men's relationships with the monks grow closer. Your words are words of wisdom. Really, you're a real beacon to us. Yeah, yeah. You know, it works both ways. Yeah, yeah. It works both ways. Yeah. You've brought a tremendous amount to this house. You've brought so much energy to this house. And you've set it on fire yeah. in a way that you, know, you may never be able to recognise. The monks decide it's time for the group to think about some of the central questions of Christian faith. It begins with S, and Gary's got it right. Sin. Oh, sin. Sin. Oh. <laughs> if Jesus is a divine person, then not surprisingly, when he dies, the post-death presence, the post-death memory, is greater than just that of an ordinary person. The first result, Eve starts blaming Adam, and Adam starts blaming the snake. You know, it all goes wrong. The relationships break down. The feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own we group. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties. Well, he's just described me pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> and all of us, that's the whole point. Yeah, yeah. And all the disciples before yeah. they... I, I think I'm too far gone, guys. Change yeah, that's a good... Well, that's what we thought, but, you know, <laughs> we're just doing it. Just giving you one last chance, you know. Who, who can live up to the precedent set out in the, in, in the, in the New Testament and in the Bible? The answer is nobody can. Exactly. But there is a difference between saying nobody can, so I'm not going to try and saying, nobody can, and I believe that the Spirit of Christ can get me towards it. And what effect are you having on human beings when you tell them they're sinners? You're putting them down. If I say to you, you, you you're a flawed human being, that doesn't put you down, does it? It might be good news and say, then there's something we can do about it. No, I don't think it's good news at all. Why not? It's, well, it's, it's because he's saying, you're starting off this on a big handicap, and this is the only way out. I'm a happy sinner. <laughs> Up to a point, I know there are some things which, um, by necessity, by virtue of living in a, in a big city and uh, working in an industry, that some things would just be too much to, to try and change it all in one go. That's summed up in, in a beautiful phrase of St Augustine, who famously said, Dear Lord, make me holy. Pause, but not yet. And I hear an echo of that in what Tony's saying. his third week, 
Nick has overcome his ambivalence towards monastic life. But he's still pondering intellectual doubts about Jesus Christ as the embodiment of God. Father Christopher wants him to get off the fence. Could you imagine yourself uh, reading a, a passage of scripture mm -hmm. like um, take up your cross and follow me mm -hmm. and that actually being for you a moment when you knew that that was God speaking to you and having a deep emotional reaction which would change the way you lived your life. I could imagine it, yes. That's what I'm encouraging you to imagine. <laughs> Can you believe that in the next three weeks you're actually going to find the page, get off the fence, make the choice, whichever of those three, images Three you weeks, want. Father. I mean, you know, well, 38 years, and you're expecting me to do it in three weeks. Yeah, but the point <laughs> I'm making to you, that's the whole point I'm making to you, is mm. um, big decisions yeah. have to be made at a point in time. Yeah. The whole God thing again. Yeah. He, he's... Um, He's not going to let me get away with being a sort of non-realist, post-liberal, you know, whatever. Um, but then, you know, he is the abbot of a Roman Catholic monastery, so... Tony is beginning to reflect on why a successful life and career has been punctuated with unhappiness. He's exploring whether the spiritual vision of the monks can offer any help with his problems. I spent two and a half weeks in the psychiatric unit. Um, having had a bit of a breakdown and uh, it all got a bit too much. So I remember walking down Shoreditch High Street, tears streaming down my face, listening to Animals by Pink Floyd, just thinking, what the fuck is this all about? You know, what am I? What is this life thing? What is this awful, awful, awful thing that I've been given? Tony chose as his mentor, Brother Francis, um, who works by day as a nurse for children with cancer. I'm not just going through the motions. I am praying, yeah. you know, with a little, dis as, I, as I keep saying, this little disclaimer at the bottom, which is sort of like, you know, if there is a God, I am praying to him. Yeah. If there isn't, then I'm just yeah. talking to myself. Yeah. Um, but I am praying, but then I feel a bit of a fraud doing that because it's like making a Christmas list. Is this just some hocus-pocus to believe in to make myself feel better mm. and to, get, you know, give my something to fall back on? Yeah. And I don't want it to be a safety net. I want it to actually serve a spiritual, but also like, you know, kind of a practical purpose in life. Well, I think if we go back to what we've, what we've spoken about before, and that's about being still and trying to be still and centred yeah. and um, being still and knowing God that God's there somewhere, I think that's rather than the sort of shopping list mm. approach. How does God speak to you? I think he speaks to me through, through experience, through other people. Um, and I think he speaks to me in the early hours of the stillness of the morning. I think you have to seek him out. Mm. And I do really feel that there's a God somewhere inside, you know, all of us. Yeah, I think maybe I'm just expecting a little bit too much, I suppose. Yeah. For me, it's about an intimate, real relationship with, 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 with my God, for want of a better word, and it's... Um, and that's an ongoing thing, and that's something I struggle with, and sometimes, you know, I walk away from, and sometimes I come back. And, um, but that's, that's ongoing work, really, and hard work. Mm. Um, but it goes back to that picture of the potter, you know, <clears throat> of God creating, you know, Adam from the clay, <clears throat> and knowing that the potter never gives up on the clay. He's never going to give up on you, you know, and he's, he's the only person that never gives up on you, even when you're giving up on yourself. It's halfway through their time here, and the abbot is worried about Peter. While happy that he enjoys analysing the religious texts, Father Christopher is keen that he should also engage with them on a personal level. Maybe those sad and angry psalms are going to help you to find a part of your inner world that you perhaps don't want to go to. OK. I don't know what I mean by that. Does that <laughs> ring any bells or not? Um, in a way it does, yes, but I've, I've, I've been to the place I think you've talked about before I came here, 
I'm just asking myself all the time, is this really relevant to us now? Gary is beginning to think more deeply about his religious past and what he thinks God wants for him. Many times I see God as a big God up there, you know, with a big stick, and every time I do wrong, he's ready to beat me, and he's ready, ready to, you know, just shun me. I think God to him wears a black balaclava and gives punishment beatings to people who don't live up to the perfect image of Christ. And Gary will always be in fear of that. Gary's hope is that once he's come to terms with his past, he will be better equipped to get married and settle down. His fear is that God has other plans. I've got such a fear inside that I'm going to be asked to be single. And, and the fear, you know, it, it cripples me at times. And there's times I won't spend time with God just in case I hear that word, you have to be single. And it stops me. And so I, I was just asking, I'm not asking you for an answer, I'm asking you for your, what would you take from that? Because you were saying there it's good to ask the advice of other people. Absolutely. You're saying those scriptures came to you spread out over a long period of time, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would have just, thought that the, the crucial other person you've got to ask in that sense is a, is a marriage partner. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the most simple answer would be this, would be if God presents you with a woman who you feel you, you should marry, then there's your answer. Yeah. And if he doesn't, then there's your answer. forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. By their fourth week in the monastery, the group seemed to be moving forward. The men even hold their own prayers, outside church, and occasionally even observe the rule of silence. Anthony feels his purpose for being here is becoming clearer. At the end of the day, we're all searching for something, aren't we? Whether it be what your mother did to you when you were a kid or whatever, and you push it to the back of your mind, and then you think you're dealing with it, and all these other things that you do, whether it be you take drugs, you drink alcohol and whatever, and you say, oh, yes, I'm over that. But, yeah, that first inclination, that very heart, the seed of it all is still sitting in there and you're actually not dealing with the actual problem, the thing that's actually creating all of this. And I would hope that whilst being here that that's actually what we'd be dealing with, with what is the source of the problem, what that seed is, to eradicate that pain, get rid of that. Anthony's conversations with Father James turn continually to his unresolved feelings about his mother. Have you ever been in love, Anthony? <clears throat> Have I ever been in love? Uh, I probably not. Hmm. If I realistically look at it, yeah. probably not. Hmm. No. I've probably been, in, been f infatuated more than in love. OK. Hmm. Why I come to that evaluation? Because you can't, I say again, you can't love anybody else until you love yourself, so no. I think there is an experience, and I know it pers personally, when two people um, love each other, what you get is, um, is a tremendous sense of peace, security, trust, honesty, and being oneself is just dead easy, just natural. And we never forget that experience, because it's so wonderful. I spent most of my childhood, and God, I could be here angry at now. Sorry, calm down. I spent most of my childhood feeling inferior to other people. You know, and I knew I wasn't. Yeah. 
But I spent most of my life feeling... Because every time I walked up, people would go, wow, look at him. But, you know, the one person who should have been doing it was the one person who was busy doing everything with everybody else and couldn't have any time for me. And then when they decide to turn around because everything's going wrong for them, mm. oh, come and help me. You know, they expect me to drop everything and come and help them. And they think, now nah, you want me to come and help you, but what does people say? Oh, well, you must go and help. So, of course, I go and help because the love I still have inside me is an opportunity to think, well, OK, maybe the bridge one day will cover itself. But sometimes you can wound somebody so badly that it's hard for them to forget that. OK, have you I seen anything no here? Answer. Have you seen anything here that, 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 that might help? Have I seen anything here that might help? Have you experienced anything here? Seen anything I've here I've experienced the lots of things here. I've experienced calmness. I've experienced hopefully the way to find a way to defeat this. You see, now, now I can take the word demon out and say that it's not a demon anymore, you know. I'd usually say fight this demon, but it's not a demon. In a way, it's me liking myself and getting over this, this wall of why and just leaving why behind and moving on. As well as exercising painful memories, just being in the monastery is having a calming effect on Anthony. Tonight I went into the church and it was just quiet with the two beams on the altar. It was actually the most kind of beautiful scene you could have obviously seen. It, it, that was what all this was about, was just peace. The stillness has also affected Nick. I've certainly found over the last few years that my meditation, my focus in life in general, has become very distracted and lost. And coming here, I've been able to snap right back into it. This is the heart of the monastic life, in here, in the middle of the night. As the group's spiritual sense grows, the daily religious discussions become increasingly relevant to their ordinary lives. The question of Christian and personal forgiveness in particular touches on deep vulnerabilities. We've been looking at, partly this week, forgiving other people. They're giving other people. If we sin, then we need God's forgiveness. That's our religious understanding. If we're hurt, we tend to build a protective barrier around us, so we're not going to be hurt again. And forgiveness is, is like risky from that point of view because we're actually exposing ourselves again. So how do we take that risk? Just go back to the year dot and go through and say, now, are there situations, people, myself in situations, God, you know, where I'm holding on to this non-forgiving? I forgive people too easily because I naturally assume that I'm probably at fault myself, which is a psychological issue. If you always play yourself as the bad guy, then you're always going to forgive the other side of the argument, which is the good guy, mm. whereas that isn't necessarily the case. I've identified what Tony's saying, because many times I forgive people pretty quick because I thought I'm the one who's in the mm. wrong all the time, mm. because I'm the victim. We can sit here and say, you know, oh, poor me, I, I, you know, I forgive people too easily because, you know, what, I could be the victim. Um, but I'm aware of people in my life who, who do forgive quite quickly, but they have been at fault as well, basically. Sometimes it's easy for them to forgive in order to try and clear their own conscience. For the first time during his stay, Peter is moved to relate his experience in the monastery to his personal history. We were talking about forgiveness this morning, and uh, Father Luke made a good suggestion to... Uh, might be something in our childhood. It immediately reminded me of, of being an evacuee 
I was about three and a half, four. And it was a big blitz, December 1940, I think. I was sent to an aunt, inverted commas, in Red Royal, and then my mother went away. And um, being a very small child, of course, I didn't understand. So what did I have to forgive? I had to forgive myself for misunderstanding their motives. And part of forgiveness is forgiving yourself too, for being, um, for not realizing your real motives. And uh, then he recommended that we set fire to the paper because that's a, a symbolic act whereby you sort of, you, pu you put it all behind you and it's, uh, it's not to, to forget it, you never do forget these things, but it's, it's to say, yeah, I've dealt with that. The past. Just ashes. The discussion of forgiveness has also stirred deep emotions in Gary. You know, I'm 36 now, and I obviously can't keep on living the way I'm going to live, worrying if Tom, Dick, or Harry's talking about me down the road, or you know, living the Christian life for a couple of months and hitting the drink for a couple of months, going and sleeping around for uh, with different women. But to me, I just can't keep on living like that because the ashamedness that that, that, that comes with it and the, and the hypocrisy and stuff like that there and the thoughts what I'm thinking that other people's thinking about me. I'll send me into a mental institution or I'll have me hanging off a rope from a beam somewhere because that is the reality of it and, that, and, and I'm saying that from, from my heart now. I'm not saying it in any other way but I, I'm meaning what I say and for me I have to get the breakthrough here. The second fortnight in the monastery is nearly over when something happens to Tony that he finds hard to explain. I had an experience today in the church. Um, and I'm not really big on epiphanies or revelations, but uh, I had a real feeling in the church today totally unexpectedly of kind of almost weightlessness um, you know I felt very floaty I felt like a huge weight was lifted physically lifted off my shoulders and I felt quite fidgety and I had butterflies and uh, and I was incredibly happy um, you know it was a real moment of clarity I feel almost embarrassed saying it, do you know? <laughs> well, if you I understand, understand because, I can, it, because it's not something I would, you know. I can see that. Feel or say. But I can understand what I'm saying back to you is that don't feel embarrassed by it because that is a very normal experience of those who really want to take a first step in a life of prayer. It's that first step where you suddenly find, to your absolute amazement, something comes back. The lessons we have, the Bible study. It's not that I don't buy it, you know, I'm not trying to be deliberately controversial, but I'm still not completely, there's still a, a big gulf between me and, and wholeheartedly embracing those texts, like, say, Gary would. Yes. You know, chapter and verse, yeah, I believe that, that's exactly how it happened, this is the Bible, it's a gift from God, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'd much... You're not, you're gonna take, it's going to take a lot longer to convince me on that. But what I would say is I wouldn't want to convince you in that way. I wouldn't want to get into that dialogue in your head in that way. But what I would say to you is, uh, when I gave people the parable of the prodigal son to read, your very quick response to that was when I said to you, read it now as a parable which speaks to you. Don't ask questions about, you know, the historical nature of it or whatever. Just, just read it as a parable for you now. And you said, well, it's obvious what the meaning is. I'm the prodigal son. Tony, Gary, Anthony, Peter and Nick now just have two weeks left in the monastery. In the final fortnight, the spiritual journey would reach unexpected conclusions. You know, I think I'm... It was a religious experience. Quite profoundly. Or I was sharing 
a religious experience with Prasad. I think that's pretty clear. But the conflicts they thought they'd overcome would come back to haunt them. Because you wouldn't know neither of you. Listen, no, I'm not happy. Because I'll tell you the reason why. Do you see, here we go again. No, hold on, no, don't okay. lose your voice, mate. Yeah, well don't, well, don't talk at me then. Well, then look at me when I'm oh, talking to you. Sure. Anthony, Who Anthony, are you talking Anthony, to? I'm talking to you. Fuck off, man. What is wrong with you? I'm not a kid, you know. I'm not a fucking kid, Gary. Thank you.